a knife that is tactical has to be able to penetrate, it has to be able to slice. It has to be strong enough to do that. There are some knives which people are calling tactical that I don't consider tactical. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's episode number 38, and I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from thenifejunkie.com. Welcome to the show. And welcome to a talk with the guy that literally wrote the book, Bob. <laughs> Indeed, Bob Terzuola, the godfather of the tactical folding knife. And yeah, he did write the book, and it's called The Tactical Folding Knife. Yeah, it's not often you get to say that line. I, I literally talked to the guy that wrote the book, or, you know, I literally wrote the book on something. But it's true. It is true. We just, uh, we had a great conversation. He's a really, um, Bob Terzuola, he's a wonderful guy, very uh, open and happy to talk about uh, his legacy and, and um, the birth of the tactical folding knife and, and the things he's brought to the table. It was a, it was a great conversation. Well, to just remind our listeners that uh, today's podcast is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed. It's your year-round tax solution. It's definitely a must-have for contractors, freelancers, anybody who's self-employed needs QuickBooks Self-Employed. And if you'll go to this link, theknifejunkie.com slash QB30, Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day free trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. So enjoy 30 days for free at theknifejunkie.com slash QB30. Follow The Knife Junkie on Instagram at theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram. I'm speaking with Bob Terzuola, the, uh, well, if I may, the legendary godfather of the tactical folder. Uh, there, there are many monikers uh, he gets for his incredible contributions to the folding knife world. Bob, welcome to The Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm a very modest person, so I'm a little bit uh, put aback when... <laughs> I hear all of these wonderful accolades going on. And then again, people have said, I've got a lot to be modest about also. So. <laughs> all right. Well, I will do my best not to be worshipful. <laughs> As we were talking before the show started, uh, you had a great deal to do with bringing about the uh, the tactical folder, which is the, the main thing I collect. It's it's something I obsess about. And so it's an honor to for me to speak with you. You, you literally wrote the book on the tactical folder. It's called the tactical folding knife. I believe the second edition is coming out soon. Uh, could you define for us, uh, from your deep perspective, what is a tactical folder? A tactical folder, actually a tactical knife, but specifically the folder, uh, it's a tool for survival. And it can be survival in any one of a number of different venues. It could be uh, in the jungle, uh, in nature, climbing a mountain, um, to be in the desert. Or it can be in an urban setting, um, if you're under attack, if you're being mugged, or even a military setting where it, it may save a life, um, either by, you know, cutting away clothing of a wound or actually holding off an adversary. It, it's basically a tool for survival. So in, in the design of a tactical folder, what are, what are the main considerations? There are a number of uh, considerations. Probably the primary one is the shape of the blade. And I specifically, uh, especially in the new edition of the book, I do have a, a definition um, that I've thought about for a long, long time. The shape of the blade is really quite important because the blade has to be able to do a number of things. Number one, has to be able to cut that is slash, slice, cut, in any kind of a situation you would imagine, you know, that's what a knife is supposed to do, is cut. Okay. However, a tactical knife also needs to be able to penetrate. It needs to be able to stab or go through pretty tough materials. It may be an animal hide. It may be um, a leather jacket. It may be uh, body armor. It may be something that is protective of the person that you are dealing against. 
Um, or it could be, you know, something, uh, you may need to, you know, punch a hole in a 55 gallon drum. And we've done that with, with knives. You may need to, as one of my, um, end users, a, a captain in the, uh, Florida police department, um, stopped, uh, a fleeing group of felons by puncturing their tire with one of my ATCFs. It's called nice. mud mud tire murder in the book. It's a short <laughs> short little story. So, a knife that is tactical has to be able to penetrate. It has to be able to slice. It has to be strong enough to do that. There are some knives which people are calling tactical that I don't consider tactical. One is, uh, for example, the sheep's foot blade, the <laughs> blade that slopes down from the top forward towards the bottom. That's good for slicing and cutting and slashing. It's not very good for penetrating. Right. The same thing with the karambit. People love the karambit because it's such a sexy, wild-looking, mean-looking knife. Okay, it really is. However, I wouldn't want to try to stab through a heavy leather jacket with mm -hmm. a karambit. And also, the blades of karambits tend to not be particularly robust, especially the point. Right. And it takes a whole lot of training to get good with a karambit. It, it, it takes training, and, and it's, um, it's, it's not the kind of knife that you can do a number of tasks with. Mm -hmm. If I was going to be dropped in the jungle, uh, in fact, which I have been <laughs> when mm -hmm. I was in Guatemala and Panama, um, it's not the knife that I would choose to take with me. So how was the, you, you mentioned Guatemala and Panama, and I know that these, uh, these locations were, were key in your development of the tactical folding knife. How, how did you identify a need for that very specific tool? Um, not so much in Panama. I was in the Peace Corps there, um, mm -hmm. for two years. I did have some experience in the jungles, um, which I dislike, by the way, just to let everybody know. I don't want to go back to the jungle. Uh, nowadays, I guess they call it uh, rainforest or wetlands. That sounds so much nicer. It sounds so much nicer, but to me, it's still a jungle, <laughs> okay, because I've been there. Anyway, um, it was in Guatemala, and I was managing a uh, jade jewelry factory. I had about 38 people working for me. Guatemala has uh, a good deal of jade, and it's part of the Maya heritage uh, that they worked jade and made uh, jade ornaments. And uh, we were uh, producing, you know, trinkets and jade crosses and various carvings. And I made the acquaintance of several people down there. Among them were uh, four or five marine security guards at the embassy. And they came to me with various little, since I had kind of a machine shop, they came to me with little, little jobs to do, little things, uh, for their, uh, MP5s. And, uh, they were using some Uzis also and mm -hmm. cut down some shotgun barrels and things like that. I was able to do some little things like that for them. And then they got interested in, um, carrying knives. They, they, they showed me the different knives that they had. Parallel with that, and basically at the same time, uh, I met um, a fellow who had bought a house next door to the jade factory. His name was Jim Atwood. He had been a captain in the Army. He uh, had quite a history, and I could probably go on for most of the rest of this session just <laughs> telling you about Jim Atwood. Suffice it to say, he had gone to Germany, uh, met his wife there, when he was in the army in the late 50s and early 60s. While in Germany, he went around to all of the knife companies in Zollingen and bought up all of the boxes and barrels and, and chests of the parts of the German daggers of World War II, all of the different daggers. And he wrote the book. It's a definitive book on the edged weapons of Hitler's Third Reich. Wow. 
and he goes into every one of, I believe, 36 uniform daggers, some of which were usable, but most of them were, um, although usable and well-made, were uniform uh, decoration pieces that went along with each uniform. That's how Hitler got Solingen out of the Great Depression, by decreeing that every uniform would have its own dagger. So he bought up all the parts, shipped them back to Savannah, Georgia, had people put them back together again, and he sold them, usually from the back of uh, men's magazines like Argosy or True Detective. You probably oh, wow. remember the little the yeah. little one-inch square uh, advertisements for the, the Luftwaffe dagger or the youth dagger and so forth. Anyway, they were all hits. They were genuine, just not put together during the war. Okay. He owned the house next door to the Jade Factory, and we became pretty good friends. Um, he was also instrumental in bringing weapons in from um, Beirut for the Contras. Hmm. While uh, I was uh, engaged with him and with the Marines also, another fellow, fellow popped up named Ed Cornelli, who was a sea captain. He was the one who actually brought the weapons over. And he and Jim Atwood uh, got to be very good friends. And he, uh, Cornelli, introduced me to a commando of five Argentine, <laughs> um, how would you put it, operators who were working in El Salvador. Okay? And I did little jobs for them. We did you know, help them clean their guns and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they asked me if I would make some knives for them because Jim Atwood had convinced me that using the machinery of the Jade Factory, I could make knives. And he loved knives. Obviously, he had collected them all. Right. And um, took it from there. And I designed um, a couple of fixed blades. They were all fixed blades. Uh, but they were all combat knives, and then I designed some hunting knives, and I got the idea that I thought I would like to join the Knife Makers Guild mm -hmm. in the United States. So um, I put together a package of knives uh, as a demonstration, to, as uh, samples, I guess you'd call it, mm -hmm. and uh, brought them up to Florida to Frank Santafonte, oh, who great. eventually became the president of the guild. And um, then I flew out to California and met Bob Loveless and asked him to sign for me, which he did, signed into the guild. So had you met him before? He's a Bob Loveless is a legendary knife maker. Had you met him before? No, I hadn't met him, but we did speak on the telephone. Mm -hmm. And that's another story if you want to hear it. It's in the book. It's how I got my Bob Loveless knife. Yeah. Um, I went to my first knife show, not as a, not as a knife maker, as a visitor at the New York custom knife show at the, in the basement of the Sheraton Hotel. It was the first knife show. And I was absolutely fascinated with it. And I loved them. And I looked around and I met, um, the number of knife makers there, Mel Pardue. Uh, was one of them and, and several other guys. And I was just fascinated and I picked up some magazines and I remember from some magazines that Jim Atwood had given me, which were, it was called the American Blade. Hmm. Not, not the Blade magazine, the American Blade. Went back to the late seventies. And I remember the name Bob Lovelace and I asked the people around there and they said, well, he's, uh, probably the, the guy who started this whole thing and he's really good. And, his knives are really beautiful. So I went back to my father's house. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. My father and mother were living in Brooklyn. I was staying with them. And uh, got on the phone, and I called up Loveless, just out of a clear blue sky. And I got to uh, talk to him. We chatted for, I don't know, maybe an hour, hour and a half. I can't remember. And I ordered a knife. It was a semi-skinner with stag handles, mm -hmm. and I sent him a $200 deposit. And don't fall off the chair. <laughs> the total price of the knife was $460. Oh, wow. Okay? How about that? <laughs> however, however, 
I had to wait 11 years before I got the knife. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. 11 years. He had completely forgotten about it. He had written it up. There was a, there was a card with a deposit. Um, <laughs> he had completely forgotten about it. Years later, many years later, that would have been about 1979 or 1980. About 1989, he called me up. We had been communicating. I was in the guild by now. Mm-hmm. And he asked me if I would make him six folding knives. I said, sure, I'd love to do that. Um, what model do you want? He says, well, I'll design it, hmm. which he did. And that became my model number six, uh, kind of a worn cliff blade. Uh, I believe it was the first folding knife with a duplex grind, the double grind on the, on the blade. Relatively small, uh, two and a half inch blade, I think, two and a quarter. Uh, he designed, that was a Bob Loveless design. I gave him credit in my, uh, catalog. And, um, he said, well, can you, uh, send them out to me? I said, sure. I said, uh, maybe our knives will cross in the mail. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, I ordered a knife in 1979 or 1980. <laughs> Can't remember when it was. He said, really? You know how Loveless was just a really gruff person, uh-huh. but a heart of gold and absolute integrity and he hung up next day he called me up he said you know i found your card you sent me the deposit i'm going to honor that original price wow. so i sent them the 260 dollars and he sent me the knife wow. which i still have what a what an amazing keepsake so you could you could probably call him a mentor for sure yeah, absolutely well he taught me how to had a hollow grind also so the the um the the group of Argentines that I met, um, the Marine security guards, Jim Atwood, uh, Ed Cornelli, they all encouraged me to continue making these knives. And that's when I got them together and went up to the States and joined the guild and went to my first knife show in, I guess it was 1982 in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And I became, uh, I became a part-time knife maker at that. I was still managing the Jade Jewelry Factory. And um the Argentines just just loved the knives that I was making, and I made them for some other security people who were working down there, um, military and private security. Mm-hmm. Guatemala was kind of a Wild West area at the time. There was a lot of unrest. Uh, communists were really kicking up a storm, and um, there was a lot of kidnapping going on and things like mm-hmm. that. And, and I, I, I did some work with private security companies down there also. Okay. So that was the genesis of my making military type tactical knives. So was the need for the folder, did that come out of uh, security, the need to be discreet or? No. I'll tell you, um, I, when I moved back up to the States, we, my, my wife and two boys and I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1984. I was still making only fixed blade knives. Mm-hmm. I got to know Michael Walker, who invented or created or developed, however you want to put it, the liner lock. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fascinated with it because it seemed to be doable with my limited equipment and machinery. Um, I didn't have very much, and I didn't. I never really wanted to put that much effort into lock back liner locks, mm-hmm. uh, lock, lock back knives, not liner locks. So I liked the liner lock. I went up to Michael to visit him, and um, he showed me how to make them and gave me permission to use them. And he and I, for a period of time, were the only ones making liner lock knives. Hmm. The reason I actually got into folders is because I realized at some point, remember now I was no longer managing the J Jewelry Factory when I moved up to Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 1984, I became a full-time knife maker. That was my only source of income. And I realized at that time that people have more pockets than they have belts. <laughs> so I realized the future was going to be in folding knives rather than fixed blades. And I hesitated a lot on the folding knives until I could meet Michael and get up with uh, with him in Taos. And he showed me how to make the liner lock, and I decided that was the way I was going to go. And I came up with two designs. 
uh, my model number one, which I call the utility. It's kind of a spear point, kind of a straight handle. Um, and I knew uh, Sal Glesser at the time from Spyderco. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed with the idea of a pocket clip. I realized the pocket clip was really, really handy. So uh, I incorporated my first ones used Spyderco pocket clips. Huh. I got them from Spyderco. Right. After a while, he was putting Spyderco and their logo on the clips, mm -hmm. which I promptly ground off <laughs> and um, continued using them for a period of time. Oh, so cool. So I came up with that design, which I called the utility model number one. And then the model number two, which was a sheep's foot mariner. I called it the mm -hmm. mariner knife. Um, and those two knives basically formed the beginning of my folding knife career. You're, you're known uh, for some innovations. Uh, I know you were a very, very, very early adopter of the pocket clip. I guess probably the second person or the first person to use it on a custom knife. Uh, what other innovations uh, did, uh, came out of your early uh, experimentation? Um, you've seen the uh, thumb disc mm -hmm. on top of blades, the knurled thumb disc. Yep. That was my invention. I really didn't like the um, stud, the thumb stud, very much. I, I I still use them on some custom knives when I make them out of gold or something like that. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, I wanted a a way of opening the knife with either thumb, mm -hmm. left hand or right hand, and I wanted to go on both sides of the knife. So I came up with the disc set into a groove in the top of the blade. Michael Walker actually started using titanium, but I guess I was the one right after him. He and I were the only two using titanium. Mm -hmm. I, I was the first knife maker to use a uh, laser, to have laser cut uh, my blank parts out. Let me back up a second. What was it about titanium that initially drew you in? The first thing that drew me in was the exotic nature of the material. At that time, in the early to mid-80s, titanium was an exotic material. It was not in common use all the way around. And it had it had quite a, um, what, would you, what would you call it, maybe panache? Or a, mm -hmm. it, it had a, it, it had a, 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 people had a vision of it that it was pure space age. Right. Okay. Right. And the fact that I was able to use lasers, to cut it out. Remember, Goldfinger was yes. everybody's introduction to the industrial laser. Mm -hmm. um, but very few people knew what you know what a laser actually did. So I had uh, I used to put the parts on the table, the titanium parts. I put them on my table at a show, uh, you know, just right off the laser, and people would look at them and pick them up, and they were just absolutely fascinated that. You know, the space age technology, not only in material, but in, um, the, uh, the manufacturing, the cutting out. Hmm. And for me, of course, it was a godsend because I didn't have to use up millions of bandsaw blades and right, right. sit behind a bandsaw, which is, you know, the worst thing in the world. So I guess I was one of the first to use titanium. I was the first to use G10 huh. on a folder as handle material. Really? Yeah, Kevin McClung was actually the first person to discover G10, but he only made fixed blades mm -hmm. completely out of G10. And the one that I saw at that time, which would have been probably the late 80s, uh, he called the Frequent Flyer. <laughs> okay, so these were knives made completely out of G10, so you could stash them and make your way through metal detectors. And stuff. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> However... I saw it as a really good, uh, grippy, lightweight, strong handle material. Mm -hmm. So I was the first one to use G10 uh, on a handle. Uh, let's see, the thumb disc. Um, the use of titanium. Use of titanium. One of the first to use carbon fiber. Actually, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, who had an injection molding plant in Romeo, Michigan, Frank, he asked permission to copy my ATCF mm -hmm. in a molded plastic uh, material. 
and he molded them left and right. Mm-hmm. With a, it would have had a titanium spring in the middle. But he did the left and right parts and a plastic clip. And that, usually they use uh, nylon with 30% glass filler, the glass filler to, to strengthen the material. Mm-hmm. He actually used carbon fiber. And as far as I know, it was the first time that any kind of carbon fiber was used in a knife handle. And that would have been, oh, maybe 89, maybe 1990, somewhere around there. So one of your most famous models is the ATCF. Okay. Uh, what, is, what does that stand for? Tell me a little bit about that and, and um, remark a little bit about the design. To me, it's, um, it's uh, what's the word? Um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's something uh, like the handle is, well, just tell me, tell me a little bit about that design. Okay. It originally started out as the model number three. So I had model number one, model number two, the Mariner, and that was model number three. And it was kind of inspired by Al Mar's uh, sear knife. He came mm-hmm. up with a knife called the S-E-R-E uh, for the... Um, the program of uh, survival, escape, survival, evasion, uh, right. resistance, and escape. Right. I may have that in the wrong order. I don't know, but something like. That. Right. Anyway, I knew Al. Uh, he, he was he was a pretty good friend of mine. I really enjoyed working with him and knowing him. The sear was a good knife. It didn't have too much finger protection to it. Uh, it was pretty heavy. Um, and it didn't have um, all of the qualities that I thought a, a good folder should have. Lightweight, easily accessible mm-hmm. uh, were two qualities that it didn't have that I really thought were important. Because no clip on that, right? No. Right. Yes, there was no clip. Correct. Anyway, um, I uh, worked and worked on the um, model number three. And I decided on a sp- the, the basic spear point with a clip on the top. Uh, it wouldn't be sharpened on the top because it's hard to do that unless you bury the blade completely in the handle. And I didn't want to do that. It would have been too bulky a handle. Uh, but it did have a clip, clip grind on the top. And the other thing I think I came up with, and I'm, I, I don't remember seeing it anywhere else, and I'm not sure that anybody else had ever done it before, is I had the, the serrated thumb ramp mm, at the top yeah. of the blade, and it mated when the blade was closed with kind of a protrusion that everybody is using now, kind of a, a finger protection, kind of like a guard, almost like a little hilt or something like that. Right. And when the blade was open, you had the serrated thumb ramp at the top and the kind of half guard uh, finger protection at the bottom acting as almost like a full hilt uh, full guard on a folding knife right and i had i had i don't know how i came up with that but i just i just playing around with a couple of pieces of clear plastic and making drawings on the plastic and um, that's the way i did it it came out so i think i was i think that was an innovation that i did also the spear point Kind of a fairly wide blade. I like the hollow grind as opposed to a flat mm. grind. Uh, Why? Most, Why is that? Um, it slices. It's not quite as robust as a flat grind, but it slices better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for slashing and slicing and cutting, especially out in the field, if you're skinning a deer or something like that, you want something that'll be uh, fairly fairly thin. But robust enough. That's why I put a uh, there's a there's a spine down the center of the blade. Mm-hmm. Um, you want something strong enough to resist breakage, but fine enough to do uh, delicate cutting. Um, the titanium, of course, like I said, lightweight, mm-hmm. very strong. The other factor about titanium, which is important, is it has so much spring to it. Its um, its recovery rate is really great. I mean, you can bend it all the way in one direction or another direction. It'll come back to where it's supposed to be. 
So, so is it uh, safe to assume that a uh, a liner lock made out of titanium rather than steel is going to be springier longer? Um, no, I don't think you could say it would be springier longer. I think you could say that for a thinner piece of material, you can get the same amount of spring and strength that you would out of a thicker piece <laughs> of stainless steel. Gotcha. Which is heavier, also. Yeah, which is which is heavier. Now, I've made uh, all of my models, I've made with the original ATCF, which, by the way, was Advanced Technology Combat Folder. The original one had titanium sides, two sides, and a titanium spring down the middle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people ask me, how come this thing is so, it's, it's, it's off center? Well, why is it, why is, why don't you put the same stuff on both sides of the, of the blade. I said, well, why? There's, there's really no need. Titanium is so strong. I just need a piece on one side to act as the handle, one piece in the middle to act as the spring, and another piece on the other side to act as another handle and an anchor for the clip. Hmm. Why would I have to put a fourth piece in there? Yeah, just make it thicker and heavier. Yeah, if any if anybody didn't like the uh, the off center uh, design of it, well, you know, they didn't have to buy it. What impact has the ATCF had in the modern combat tactical knife? That seems to be the knife uh, that and the Eagle Rock to me are, are are your two greatest, most beautiful knives. No, thank and you. You're welcome. And they also seem to be the ones that I hear other people talk about the most. What do you think it is about those? two in particular uh, that resonate with people? Um, the ATCF, probably because it was, the, it was the beginning of a genre. And we, we actually made some T-shirts that had the drawing done by a really good friend of ours, um, Lydia Roberts, of the ATCF completed and then the various parts behind it. And the legend is the classic shape that's shaped in industry. Uh. And uh, for some reason or other, I thought that really fit. Uh, so many people have copied it, making little variations here and there and a little bit, you know, but you, you see the serrated thumb ramp at the top. You'll see the disc. You'll see the um, the finger guard, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, butt area, which is very similar. Um, you know, a lot of knife makers are, are, and, and they're, they're welcome to it. You know, I never patented it. I never got a design patent on it or anything. But I was just, uh, happy to see that it was a design that, uh, people could use on a daily basis. They could carry it around with them and it would perform a variety of functions, pretty much whatever they were doing. I have never held one, uh, of either one of those, but they strike me as, um, being neutral in the perfect way, neutral to the hand in that you can use it in any grip, and yet you still have uh, the reassurance that if you have to thrust with it, uh, you, ha you have proper protection for your fingers. But in reverse grip or, or uh, edge in, any of those, it, it looks like any grip is comfortable. And to me, you're talking about uh, this being a knife that can be used in so many different situations, whether it's uh, self-defense or dropped in the woods that uh, you definitely want that sort of neutral aspect. Uh, you, there's also a little bit of that also with the blade. It's not a crazy blade design. It just looks perfect. Now, I saw a video. You were talking about how uh, you get the profiles of the blade uh, laser cut or water jetted out, but you do all of the grinding, including the main bevels and everything. Correct. Uh, tell, tell me, but does that result in slightly different knives each time? Is that a uniqueness there? Um, I'm sure there are certain variations. I've gotten pretty good at, at, uh, at grinding. Um, I would say, you know, in the earlier, the earlier years of doing the ATCF or any of the folders, uh, let's say up through the nineties and so forth, I would go to a show with maybe 10 or 15 of the ATCF and, you know, I'd, I'd go with maybe 30 knives mm -hmm. altogether. 10 or 15 would be ATCS, and the other ones would be different models. They were pretty consistent. The, the, the designs of the, the, the workmanship of the, of the blades was pretty consistent. 
I'm pretty good at doing it. In the past, oh, I don't know, six or seven years, I've gotten a little bit tired of doing many of the same things. <laughs> so I'm really kind of concentrating on unique designs, one of a kind. They're almost all one of a kind now. When I go to a show, <laughs> I try not to bring two of the same thing. Ah, that's so cool. Now, that having said that, <laughs> having said that, this is my 75th year. Mm -hmm. I'm 75 this year. Wow. So um, Susie and I came up with the, actually Susie came up with the idea of making 75 knives. We're calling it 75 for the 75. And they're ATCFs. They have two dragons, one looking forward and one looking behind with a 75 in the middle. And I'm actually doing 75 knives this year. Oh, that is cool. It's cool. It's also, <laughs> I got to say, it's kind of boring. Daunting. Oh, okay. I got but, it. But it is, it, is, it is a unique type of thing. There's another unique thing that I'm doing. When I was uh, 50, every knife that I made that year had a gold plug in the blade oh, for cool. my 50th birthday year. Right. This year, every knife that I'm making has a diamond in it. Get out of here. Yes. Seriously. Wow. I could, if <laughs> Putting we were, it even further out of reach. For if, me. We, <laughs> if we were doing this on television, I could show them to you. Oh, that's the, um, the The, the one-of-a-kind knives that I'm bringing to shows have uh, cut diamonds in gold um, cups. They're, they're basically a, a, what do they call it, a single diamond earring? Oh, uh, like a bezel? Yeah, there's a, there's a word for it. I can't remember what it is. Okay. Um, but anyway, I got a bunch of those, and those go in the, in the, uh, unique ones. The 75, uh, into the backspacer, I'm setting a diamond cube. They're, they're rough, God. cubic diamond crystals. They're not very big. They're about, uh, 330 seconds, maybe about 90 thousandths across, but very visible, and they're, going into the spacer of each one. I finished about, oh, 26 or 27 of those now. So who who is your customer now? I, I'm assuming this is none of these are going to Argentinian commandos. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, only two of them survived their time down there. Uh, yeah, three of them, they, they, they were ambushed on the way out of Guatemala. Ah. Anyway, um, no. Um, I have uh, collectors, uh, individual people who, who collect my knives, and I have a couple of really, um, really big collectors. Uh, I have one collector who has over 160 of my knives, another wow. one has 115, and another one in Chicago has, oh, I think 70 or 60 or 70, something like that. I do sell to people... Um, Mainly now on the internet and a couple of shows. Mm -hmm. um, I have an internet uh, internet. I have an Instagram uh, feed that has about twenty two thousand followers. Mm -hmm. And um, usually, when I put a knife up, it goes within a short period of time. <laughs> I would have met. Um, uh, we we put up the seventy five knives. Actually, a, a few fewer than that. Because I've got friends and family that have to get a couple of them. Right. Um, and I think we sold 68 of them in the first day. Wow. So, so uh, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the collaborations you've done um, over the years and also the ones, there are a couple of exciting ones happening right now with MKM and with Drop. Okay. Tell me a little bit about working collaboratively. You've been a custom knife maker uh, your most of your career working in your shop. Mm-hmm. What's it like working with the opposite, a massive company? Um, it depends on the company. Mm -hmm. And I've had some super really good experiences and some not so good experiences. Uh, the first one I did was with Spyderco, and that was 1989. That was a really important knife. It was called the C-15. And Sal Glesser... Uh, and I decided that uh, it was time for Spyderco to start doing a collaboration with a custom knife maker. There were a number of people that he had approached and 
they had basically turned them down because they didn't want to make a knife with a hole in the blade. <laughs> and that's Spyderco's, I guess you're... A trademark. Kind of. It's kind of a trademark, yeah, the, the, the hole in the blade. I'll give you just a, a very brief idea of the what the C-15 was. Uh, it was just a, it was a relatively small knife, a uh, hole in the blade. It was the first commercial knife to be made of ATS-34, which was became a standard later on. Uh, no, but at that time, 1989, every knife that was commercially made was being stamped. <laughs> you can't stamp ATS-34. It's too hard. Yeah. So it was also the first knife that used laser or soft tooling to cut the blades out. Okay, that was the first commercial knife to have ATS-34, first laser. It was the first commercial knife to use G10. <laughs> it was the first commercial liner lock in the world. Wow. It was the Spyderco knife. We got, we couldn't find anybody to make them. We looked around. We finally found um, Les Diasis. <laughs> Do you know the name? Yeah, Benchmade. Yeah. Exactly. That knife started the Benchmade Knife Company. How about that? He didn't have the Benchmade Knife Company at the time. He had he, he didn't have anything except a storefront in, I think it was um, Oregon or Washington. I can't remember where. And um, that knife was his first venture um, into liner locks. It was, the whole, it was the first liner lock in the world that was commercially made. And uh, became, he, he went on from there to build the uh, Benchmade Knife Company. So, if you had to um, get a tactical knife from a um, manufacturer, who do you think manufactures good tactical knives? Out there? Interestingly enough, um, we knives in China, who are making the drop knives, mm -hmm. are one of the best. Uh, I mean, their 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 workmanship is superb. Okay, Boker does. Excellent, beautiful work in Germany. Hmm. Um, I would have to, I would have to think about, you know, too many others. Well, you mentioned. Wu. I really haven't thought about that. That an answer to that question. It's kind of an unusual question. I can understand that, and you're also kind of in in rarefied air. You brought up Wee knives, and we and Riot and Reich and Bestech and a, and a number of these very high end Chinese uh, manufacturers are putting out knives that are outstanding in terms of their uh, fit and finish and engineering and uh, and design. How do you feel that uh, that these new companies um, that are producing these sort of somewhat inexpensive high-end knives, how are they uh, affecting the market? We've seen a shift in the market towards, let's say, away from the higher-end, more expensive custom one of a kind knives. And part of this is that because of the internet, because of the high quality knives that are coming in of an inexpensive nature, knives aren't being collected as they used to be. There are fewer people buying knives to keep them in a collection having some sort of a unified um, concept of a collection. Mm -hmm. All the knives of one knife maker, uh, all karambit knives, or knives of, uh, you know, all sheep's foot blade knives from 20 different makers, however you want to, you know, create a collection. Mm -hmm. People now, a lot of people, especially the younger generation, they're buying knives from custom knife makers to see how fast they can flip them <laughs> and make a profit. My feeling is that after a period of time, that's going to fall apart because you can only flip a knife for profit a certain number of times. Pretty soon, you reach a point like musical chairs where nobody wants to buy at that price, or the, how shall I put it, the reputation of the maker falls apart, mm -hmm. which has happened, and I've seen that. It's it's become 
it's become a more difficult um, market, possibly because of the influx of many, many cheap knives. There's also an influx of many, many young knife makers, <laughs> new knife makers, who are coming in and buying CNC mills <laughs> and doing them automatically, doing a lot of work automatically, where they can make a lot of knives relatively inexpensively in their garage. Uh, literally, you can, you can buy a CNC milling machine from Haas. Oh, a used one, I guess, for $20,000, maybe even less, and start turning out multiples of the same knife. Now, the advantage of a CNC mill or CNC machine is that um, you can make a hundred of the same knives. Mm -hmm. The drawback is that you have to make a hundred of the same knives in order to pay for the machine. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not, it's not really, uh, it's not something where you can just make one knife and then go on and make another knife. Um, you can use it as a tool, but it's, it's not as efficient. It, its efficiency is in production. I, I, I feel like that's the sort of thing that you have to have a couple of ducks in a row before you you make that CNC commitment. A, you have to you have to know that you love coding and that you're you're really uh, you know you're going to figure out exactly what your limits are with the with the software because there's a lot of soft it's a lot of computer work involved. And then uh, you you better not just be making this a hobby. <laughs> you you better make a go of it because yeah, those machines are extremely expensive. That's true. Yes, it is. So what does your production process look like? Well, I have uh, blank parts cut from um, titanium and steel. Basically, it's what I call generic parts, or sometimes we call them coupons. For example, the handle will be a rectangle with a hole in it. And I'll use uh, two of those to make the handles. And what I'll do is I'll draw on there with a Sharpie, and um, screw the two of them together in the proper places, uh, lining up the holes. The hole would be the pivot hole. Everything everything in folding knives is gauged and referenced off the pivot hole. I do have the pivot hole done by uh, Waterjet. So these coupons are made by Waterjet. Okay. Basically a rectangular piece about the length, a little bit wider than a knife. Line up the uh, pivot holes, draw on it with a Sharpie, Cut it out on the bandsaw. Basically, I do the same thing with the blades, except instead of cutting out on the uh, bandsaw, I cut it out uh, on the grinder because I do all my work uh, in the hardened state. I heat treat the blades first. And I don't use a computer. I, I don't have, um, I don't know much about computers. At my age, you know, I decided it's a learning curve that I really never wanted to get into. It was, I mean, I do use computers. I, you know, a smartphone. I've got an iPad. I mean, just like everybody in the world has. Mm -hmm. But I don't have, um, you know, the programs to do drawing and, and whatever they call them. Right. What I do is I still use a uh, pencil and paper. If I'm going to draw it on a pencil and paper, uh, uh, draw it on a piece of paper. Um, or, um, I'll get the coupons, as I said, the titanium, Coupons, uh, they're about uh, maybe four and a half inches long, uh, about an inch and three quarters wide. And I'll hit it with a Sharpie, and uh, away we go. Start grinding and cutting away. And that's, you know, every once in a while I come up with a design that, you know, I get about three quarters finished and say, well, you know, I don't really like that one that much. One of my philosophies is never throw away a knife, just make it smaller. <laughs> yeah, I got you. You can grind away the stuff that you don't like, and yeah, and so, eventually it will. Yeah, I, I have to say it's it's inspirational to hear how much handwork goes into you. The fact that you're drawing everything out with a sharpie, you're cutting things out with a bandsaw. So, uh, unfortunately, I've never even held one of your knives in my hand, but but now you know, knowing a little bit more of how much of your of you goes into each and every knife, I. I can't wait for the day that I uh, that I get to pick one up. Well, I hope you can. I I will say I, I do I do have to say one caveat hmm. that for these seventy five knives I'm doing, yeah. I am having the handle parts cut out 
in shape. I'm not cutting those out on the bandsaw. That would be crazy. I'm <laughs> I not think, crazy. I think that can be forgiven. That is a tried and true shape. It's not changing at this point. Okay, let someone else cut it out. So, so you have the 75 uh, uh, ATCFs. Uh, tell everybody um, about some of your other exciting projects right now. Uh, if they want to get into a Bob Terzuola designed knife, uh, if they can't get a, a one from your custom shop, what other projects you have going on? Well, we've got a couple with um, Drop being made by We. There is an ATCF uh, Tonto blade coming out uh, relatively shortly. I, I can't give you a date because I just don't know it. Mm -hmm. But we did get a couple of uh, samples. The superbly made, <laughs> really nice. I like them a lot. They're not the full, full, full size. They're a little bit smaller for, uh, I guess you would call it, everyday carry. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're also working on a karambit. Not my favorite design. I was basically coerced into it. <laughs> but uh, I did think it would be an interesting idea, an interesting project. I did want to try my hand at it just to see if I could do it. And I came up with a fairly decent one. We're going to call it the Dragon's Claw. Oh, sweet. I, I look forward to checking that out, a, yeah. a Bob Terzuola Karambit. We've got some more um, with uh, MKM mm -hmm. and with Fox. Uh, they have a, 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 a nice folder. And uh, we, I just gave them a few more um, fixed blades mm -hmm. at the bl at the blade show that they're going to be doing. Oh, nice! And uh, we're going to be doing some work directly with We. Oh, cool! In okay. China, because I have such a great respect for them. I really do. I mean, they are yeah. they 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 are sincere in the work that they do, and I like it. This, uh, I was, I was, uh, before we wrap, uh, I was recently speaking with, um, uh, Elliot and Chris Williamson of Ferrum Forge. And something that is very interesting to me about how they do things sounds like what you're doing too is making the high end custom things by hand in the shop. That never goes away. Uh, doing things, uh, in a mass collaboration, uh, sort of scenario, like with Drop, where they're, or mm -hmm. a couple, couple yes. involved. And then what they, they also have their, their mid tech, their midline uh, pro series where they work directly with we and they're producing their designs. I, I think it's a, a really smart way to go about things from a business perspective. And it's great for us, the buyers who are smitten with uh, your designs, but you know, can't quite get into one right now, you know? Yeah. No, I understand. I, I love it. I, I'm, I'm really happy with this new way uh, knives are, are being made and distributed. Yeah. I'm very impressed with uh, Elliot's um, uh, carvings. Mm, yes. He spent, uh, I've seen him, I've been at his place when he was doing carvings, <laughs> and I've seen him do them. And it's, it's, it, it requires a lot more patience than I have. Spoken, say, you know, from, from a jade carver, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good compliment. Well, Bob Terzawola, uh, I could, I could go on and on and, and hear more stories. Uh, but for now, that's going to have to do it. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome, Bob. So happy to talk to you. We can do it again sometime and, you know, talk about other things. That would be great. That would be great. Other things, as long as they uh, revolve somewhat around pocket knives, I'd be, I'd be so That's great. Thank you so much, Bob Terzuola. My pleasure. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? then you're probably a knife junkie. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Interesting conversation with Bob Terzuola, if I got that right, Bob DeMarco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did indeed. Bob and Bob on this uh, this week's show. Uh, what uh, what was your uh, big takeaway? What did you, uh, you get out of your conversation with the other Bob? Well, I, you know, the, the biggest takeaways I got were just kind of discovering who I was actually talking to, you know, all these, mm. all these uh, things I take for, for granted or, uh, uh, you know, from the materials that are commonplace in knives now, like titanium and features like the ambidextrous thumb disc uh, for opening the knives, liner locks. He was the first one to uh, pump that out in the, mm. uh, in the tactical world, uh, borrowing it from uh, uh, Michael Walker, just talking to a guy like Bob Terzuola, it just makes me grateful. Uh, you know, this is the guy who basically invented the thing I collect. And I, I'm sure he would uh, he would humbly uh, uh, turn away from that that uh, that statement. But it's true. If if he weren't around, maybe you you'd be collecting. I don't know. 
yeah. watches. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> that sounds even expensive. more expensive. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have to say, uh, uh, it is also a fantasy of mine to have uh, either one of those 75th anniversary ATCFs, uh, his his most uh, famous knife, I guess you'd say, or a stag handled ATCF. I mean, when. <sighs> The other thing uh, about speaking with him is that he's still making everything by hand. He's still drawing things out. Uh, this legend is still drawing things out in Sharpie and cutting it out by hand on his bandsaw mm-hmm. and making every knife by hand down to the the smallest detail. And that's mm-hmm. that's part of what you know gives it its value. And right. to have one of those exactly. with a stag handle would be amazing. Yeah. So well, you know, custom knife made by hand. I mean, yeah, you're talking about talking about value there, time there, but you know it's going to be done right. Yep, and it's going to have soul in it. Yeah. Well, uh, one final thing. We we started off the show talking about the guy who wrote the book, and he did. The uh, Tactical Folding Knife, a study of the anatomy and construction of the liner locked folder. I wonder if he got paid by the number of words he could use in the title. But <laughs> but I did a, a quick... Um, you know, Google search as we were as we were chatting or you were chatting with with Bob. Uh, if you'd like to pick up one of those books, they go for uh, anywhere from four hundred to eight hundred dollars. <laughs> but good news is he's what coming up with an updated version or a new book yeah. sometime soon. Yeah, well, the uh, the original version is out of print, as many books do. But he's uh, this will be the updated version, and I'm not exactly sure when it's coming out, but. When it does, I'd love to have him back on the show just to uh, promote it and talk about some of the updates. And uh, and really, it's kind of interesting to just to see definitions put on things. You know, you, you see the products in the industry just keep advancing and becoming more and more um, interesting and futuristic. And it's always good to tie it back to the origins. Well, and we'll end with this. Remind you that uh, the Knife Junkie podcast can also be listened to on YouTube. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. And if you want to uh, see a lot of uh, great knife pictures, check out thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram. Going to wrap it up for episode number 38 of the Knife Junkie podcast. I'm Jim Person. And for Bob DeMarco, we want to say thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.